For days it has been bitter cold. Today the mercury shows 25 degrees below zero. A thick white snow cover wipes out the sharp contours of the vast ruins. But there are always new impacts from all size of caliber tearing through the beautiful whiteness of the cover, leaving terrible black and red stains. A difficult period is now starting up again. God only knows what lies ahead in the next weeks. This gentle calm is abruptly torn apart by all the flares from the Soviet bombers. From this moment forward, the sky is not for a single second without these artificial stars. It is strangely quiet along the entire Woronesh sector. People are saying that the Soviets have withdrawn large troop contingents in order to deploy them further south for larger offensives. Let's just wait and see. Our lands are great at spreading rumours. It is highly unlikely that we would have indeed had a few quiet days. Up to now we have always been in the thick of it. I believe that it will continue just like this after fresh reinforcements arrive. Marching orders are here. How many have we already received during this godforsaken campaign? We're back on our feet and then loaded onto cargo trains, headed up north again for a change. For 48 hours we haven't looked over the edge of the trench or even across the lightly snow-covered marsh of the front, where underneath its dirty skin hundreds of mines lie. Neither have we looked through the binoculars to watch the Bolsheviks, in their bunkers and deep sap trenches with their machine guns. For 48 hours we didn't need to duck and huddle in the dirt whenever the enemy would extend his long arm of heavy weaponry over the German positions, as if trying to erase everything that sticks out of the ploughed earth. We didn't have to listen to the sound of Stalin's organs at night, when the darkness is illuminated by the ghostly light of bright flares, and the silence is abruptly pierced by the hissing of grenades and the barking of machine guns, which can bring death a hundredfold just seconds later. The following order, Company to Transfer North, has taken us away from deprivation and the desire to just survive, as well as the constant stress on our nerves, senses and muscles to the comforting safety of this heated cargo train. We are moving along nice and slowly, kilometre by kilometre to the north. Where to? Nobody knows. It doesn't matter anyway. Warmly packed into straw, we start to doze off until we finally fall into a calm, restful sleep. The following five days and nights are worry-free, sleep-filled travel across the wide and deadly white Russian plain. Then we are unloaded. Forgotten is the gigantic field of rubble of Woronesh, the city of death. We are again in the flatlands, and as protection against the cold and the enemy, we have to rely on the dirty, stinking Panjé huts. Soldiers, soldiers, hla. During the icy day, we endure snowstorms. During the night, short, restless sleep in filthy, rusky sacks. Not that we haven't rested our occasionally clean bodies in hundreds of European beds. We have dreamed nice dreams in the fancy Baroque beds of French chateau that had nothing to do with war. We have lain on straw sacks in English bunkers, and with our hearts thumping we have listened to the impacts of fire salvos and caught bedbugs on Moroccan reed mats. We have had inappropriate dreams on the clean, cool sheets of Belgian boarding school beds of innocent girls whose more or less virgin bodies used to lie there. We have wiped off the dust and sweat of the battlefield on down comforters. We have experienced the most stubborn bedbug attacks from the leather sofas of Polish Jews, in the clean pillow mountains, fresh-smelling embroidered covers of the western Ukraine we have dreamed of home. And lately we have gotten to know the terrible Russian sacks in the Soviet paradise. We have become experts in the hospitality business, and in the future even the dirtiest and slimiest host will not faze us. We have experienced all degrees of physical humiliation with our own bug-infested bodies. You should see our solemn faces when we find a panje hut at night, before the frighteningly fast approach of darkness, which doesn't yet have a pencil note on its door that reads, Occupied by unit number, whatever. Even when a full dozen stinking locals already populate the small wooden room, the few of us still fit comfortably inside. A panje hut eats up people endlessly. We spread out on the floor along with the Russians. Whole generations move on top of the wide, expansive stove, which takes up almost half of the entire room. Wife and child, man and bugs, eight or ten or twelve or fifteen are lying up there, but not because we took their space. 
Even when we are not there, they are huddled on top of or behind the stove. For us, the archetype of living and comfort is the amount of space. With Russians, it's different. First comes the oven. There are those who have simply thrown a few boards together and a roof on top and have their finished panja hut. That's how we live nicely separated, some on top of the oven and the others in the rest of the hut, while a small lamp on a little shelf below an icon burns all night. In spite of the filth and the bugs, we are experiencing a few happy carefree days in these pitiful huts. One or the other even dares to think it possible to celebrate Christmas here in relative safety and respite. But only the absolute idealist would be able to think like that. For me, I act like I always have during this damn campaign. You just put dirty laundry in a water bucket and you look forward to putting on a clean shirt for once. Never mind that we just received marching orders. This time we have to deploy especially fast. The wet laundry is stuffed into our backpacks, and 30 minutes later we are marching south toward an unknown destination. Judging by the pace of the march, something is on fire somewhere. After a record march, we reach Castoruoje. New combat-ready troops are sent our way, and in a few hours the new battalion of army panzerjagers is ready for action. Despite the great honour, not many units become Wehrmacht troops, we are not sure how to feel about this. Things look fishy in the south. The many ambulances we encounter are not exactly elevating the mood. After a short visit with our Hungarian brothers-in-arms, we reach Rossosh, where the Italian AOK, Italianischen Arme Oberkommando, is located. There I am met by serious faces. In bad French, one asks this or that person where things stand. The short conversations are unclear and nervous. In the evening, in a biting snowstorm, we reach the position of the Alpini Corps. That same night, a tank-supported attack by the Soviets is halted, and the enemy is beaten back across the River Don. The young division suffered its first losses. In the following clear, freezing cold and moonlit night, the enemy pushes across the ice of the Don once again with their giant steel guns. The battle lasts until the morning hours. One can tell, however, that we haven't known the Russians since just yesterday, that a lot is feigned over there, for the Red Schwein are trying to fake large attacks in order to divert us from other positions. This is confirmed by prisoner testimony. These observations and predictions are forwarded to the Italian commando stations. Everything is done through the German communications staff. For hours, the situation is discussed in bad school French. There is no agreement. The German communications officers are judging the situation differently, probably more accurately, than the Italian gentlemen. More things are translated. The German officers would like to pound their fists on the table, but they have to be courteous toward their brothers in arms and smile politely. Valuable time passes. Nothing happens. Poor Schweine in the trenches. They have recognised for a while that a catastrophe is approaching. Dark premonitions are blackening the heart. Once again, the well-worn photos of sweethearts, wives and mothers are wandering through the hands of the infantrymen. Not a good sign. In the night, we are withdrawn from the Alpini position. This happens head over heels this time. At first light, we scoot across the frozen swamps of the Kalitwa toward the south while staying close to the front. Here, things are volatile. What a bad beginning. In Orobinsky, we are meeting up with the first German infantrymen. Run down and bloody, they look at us with grey faces and without saying anything. A real frontline pig knows what's going on. Even without words, we know that a big disaster is looming ahead, as the smell of dead bodies is hanging in the air. Things are looking foul. The front rolls and swells, creating a wall of mud behind which I seek shelter from the icy wind drizzling down into the shallow, dirty yellow creeks. A wild confusion reigns on the bumpy, frozen village streets. Dangerous nerves have taken over. The artilleryman, who is usually an easy-going, animal-loving country bumpkin, beats on his poor, skinny horse in a way that is heartbreaking. The tormented animal bucks and the reins get tangled with an oncoming pay cake carriage. The usually calm and patient truck driver breaks sharply, and the back of the heavy truck slides sideways and hits an infantry vehicle loaded with small packages. A chaos of vehicles and men... The responsible parties are screaming and swearing, and the Italians are barking and yelling in their pitched voices. Speaking of Italians, 
All of a sudden I come to a realisation, and it becomes frighteningly clear what is going on here. I had already been wondering on the way down why we were encountering so many small and large groups of Italian soldiers in loose packs without any leaders. After exchanging a few words with a comrade who has more information about the situation, it becomes clear to me, those guys are taking off. They are running away just like their officers, who have already saved their own valuable lives. A handful of Germans are left behind to bleed to death faced with a force 20 times superior. These oncoming packs are also blocking the roads for those what want to come to the aid of our condemned comrades. Full of hate and disgust, we look into the faces of those running away. Cowards, you have taken away the faith in comradeship in arms forever. You have been and will remain traitors. The German High Command is putting pressure on the Italian AOK, -OK, trying to get them to stop the oncoming flood. And once again there is translating and negotiating without results, because the panic-inducing rumours of the fleeing, today I know it must have been an entire army, causes even the courageous Italians in the hinterland to pack their bags. The great comrades of the neighbouring Alpini Corps want to save the honour of their countrymen. Feverishly they are trying to establish positions where they can regroup those who are fleeing. The ground is frozen too deeply. Too late. Everything is too late. It is bitter cold and biting icy wind chills you to the bone. We are therefore glad to get orders at noon to move into our positions. The second company with wonderfully equipped vehicles and guns is withdrawn to go back into position a few kilometres further south. We never saw them again. Our unit has been deployed to Zapkowo, where we try to settle down and get somewhat comfortable in the primitive bunkers. My special attention is on the Italians. If the situation were not so deadly serious, one would have to laugh wholeheartedly. With downcast eyes, like thieves, one after the other is taking off. Their faces are yellow, and it probably doesn't look much better in their pants. Trucks that do not start right away in this deadly cold are simply left behind. Nobody takes on the transportation of the enormous food supplies that are stored here in large warehouses. Too bad the guards are still posted in front of them, otherwise we would know what to do. With the evening comes food and good news. Now that our stomachs are filled, we are looking confidently toward the next hours. Everything will be fine. In the morning, there will be an attack and a police regiment is moving in for reinforcement. A large battery close to the big mountain of Zapkowo will go into position during the night in order to play the accompanying music to the attack. It's an icy, clear and moonlit night. It is barbarically cold, about 35 degree below. Without gloves, our skin would stick to the metal of the weapons. In the direction of Orobinsky, the sky becomes a trembling firewall for a few minutes from the impacts of Stalin's organs. Her thunderous drumming reminds me of the best times. Through the thunder and crashing we were unable hear the soft singing and familiar chugging of the Ivans. All of a sudden a gurgling rustle. We have just enough time to kick ourselves in the butt before there is an enormous explosion on the ground. A hundred metres away a second bomb hits. Bits fly in the air like fireworks. My neighbour, who is a metal worker in his civilian life, is reminded of the shower of sparks from a welding torch. This guy is not altogether wrong. From this point on, the thunder of the explosions is constant. The bombers aren't paying any attention to us anymore. Instead, they are dropping bombs in clusters at the entrance of the town, where the road becomes very steep. Damn. That must be just the spot where one of us saw the heavy battery a little while ago. We are in deep shit. A little before midnight, a high-ranking officer comes to me in my bunker. He is the commander of the heavy battery. Desperately, he tells me that for the last two hours he has tried to move up the mountain unsuccessfully. The road is completely iced over, and the guns are sliding sideways. For two hours the Ivans have been dropping bombs there. Half of the battery is blown to pieces. A mush of blood and metal is lying in the street. It must be terrible. The man is so angry he has tears in his eyes. We are supposed to help and move in with our traction engines. It is very difficult to explain to him that we have just enough gasoline for an emergency, in case we have to evacuate the most valuable parts. No Italian position gave us any gas. The German soldiers can bleed. The Italian gentlemen need the gas to flee. Bitter and disappointed, he goes back to the rest of his battery, which is still being bombarded by the Russians. We are feeling terrible. 
We couldn't help our good comrades from the artillery, and tomorrow we can't expect any help from them. It will be a pitiful attack without their heavy fire. And all of that because of a few litres of gasoline, because of the stinking Italians. Things are looking bad. We attacked this morning. The police regiment is bleeding to death under the overwhelming pressure of the Russians. Even us Germans can't hold on any longer. Large sections are already surrounded. Others have been blown to smithereens by Stalin's organs and by tanks. Before midday, Russian tanks unexpectedly break through into the town. Systematically, they shoot at all vehicles, setting them on fire. We ourselves are then hunted down like rabbits. We can't advance through the deep snow. Someone falls, is grabbed by the tracks of the T-60, and crushed to a pulp. One can only talk about this with a few weak words. What remains hidden is the terror and the horror of it all. At noon, we have to evacuate the town. We can't hold it any longer. Shrapnel is flying all over the streets from the constant impacts, and the biting smoke obscures our vision. Reception Camp Swanorka. Everyone who is able to escape destruction gathers here. Good God, what must we all look like? I wouldn't bet a dime on my life. In an hour at the latest, the enemy tanks will be here. We have nothing to put up against them. Nothing. Ahead at the road junction, a mounted messenger is approaching. They still have these in this war? There is no time to admire him. Vroom! Bullseye. Man and horse burst into atoms. My stomach turns sour. Damn it, even we don't see things like that every day. In the evening, I receive orders to bring all secret documents to safety and to try to break through to Krinichnaya. I take the regiment assistant along. An enemy tank had rolled over both of his legs. The poor guy screams at every hole in the bumpy road. Everything is so wonderful that you just want to puke. On the road, I run into an Italian transport with ten heavy trucks. These Italians are busy throwing the shells that are desperately needed on the front into the ditch so that they can get away faster. All I can see now is red. Senseless rage takes hold of me, and like the devil himself, I drive right into the trembling pack. Supposedly, I was even shooting, according to what the driver told me later. It's possible I'm not aware of what I did. It doesn't matter, for things were exploding left and right. Hundreds of Italian trucks are standing around everywhere, left behind by the cowardly pack. Other than a few exceptions, all of them are scooped up by the Russians an hour later. One can't even think about it. Just like that, they left the food supplies for an entire corps behind. That was supposed to last until May 1943. The Reds are all over it now, stuffing themselves with all that wonderful food. About 80,000 cans of meat, tons and tons of lard, hard sausage, 500 sacks of coffee, 20,000 litres cognac, etc. Not to mention all the other stuff. Just two days ago, we had a glance into the large warehouses and smiled at a few hundred hams with our mouths watering. What a pity, what a pity. Zwanoka had to be evacuated also. We retreat under heavy fire, and OB is seriously wounded. Reception camp moves to the east along Golubaya Krinitsa. In Golubaha, close to the sheep farm, is the division post. Since this morning, the Reds have been attacking with strong air power. Four fighter planes fly over the sheep farm around noon, apparently not paying any attention to us. Ten minutes later, they return. Before we can take cover, bombs are raining down on us, but there are no explosions. Duds. The men are just getting up from the dirt in order to discuss the bad Russian ammunition when the earth explodes around us. It suddenly occurs to me. Timed fuses. Black, stinking smoke is all around me. The gas is burning! Somebody shouts. Out of the smoke, a small Russian comes running, the driver of the gasoline truck. Like a human torch, he stumbles a few steps. Then the burning roof of a house slides down and buries him. Covered in blood, Heinz Stichel breaks down. Eichler is lying next to his vehicle with his legs shattered. Yellow clouds of gas are rising out of the bomb craters. Right there lie the completely torn apart bodies of Muller and Fritz Knoll. Poor good boy. Little Nolta, our excellent head physician, is sitting against the torn-up wall of a panja hut. He looks into the distance as if he were dreaming. Everything around him no longer involves him. He must be thinking of his baby boy who was born eight days ago. A faint, narrow line of blood is running across his boyish face. On top of his head I see something white, his brain. 
In a very low voice, he is saying just one word, pity. For the past few days, we have been in Rossosh, 18 or 20 kilometers behind the new front. Only one company, already diminished by 50%, remains to face the enemy. In a short period of time, the young, strong division has been beaten up and over a hundred men are missing. How many of them might still be alive behind enemy lines? December 24th, Christmas Eve. Across the snow and ice and through the black, stormy night, our thoughts are with our families at home, where at this hour the candles of the Christmas tree are casting a gentle light on the children's beaming faces. Erica, where a pretty young wife with moist eyes is holding the Christmas letter from her beloved in her hands, and her thoughts are reaching out far away, across the ice of ancient old rivers, across the tattered Russian forests where the wolves are hauling, across the rubble of large cities, which have lost their horror under a sad, drab snow cover, past the pitiful Panjay huts, all the way to her loved one. Silent night, holy night. Silent! The thumping and roaring of the front is making the windows shake. Holy! Ahead, the red murderers brandish their tenfold superior force against the wretched German reception post. The drunken, yelling thugs stick their bayonets into the twitching bodies of our wounded comrades. Peace on earth! God in heaven, when will that be again? The candles on our little tannenbaum have burned down. We have read the many lovely words from home. It's warm in our little room, and it is warm in our hearts. I am happy and content. Don't I have all the reason to be? We are not facing the enemy, and we have received a hundred good things to eat and drink. A little bit of good wine has chased the bad ghosts of this bloody battle away. What remains are the appreciation and gratefulness to be alive. Who doesn't dream of the comfort of being with wife and child? At home, Germany. The Red Flood has come to a standstill, as a small dam, a thin front of brave German men does not budge. They are holding their position. It's another story in the south, where the enemy has advanced to the west and the southwest, having taken over Milleroo, and now standing threateningly close to Rostow. Despite our pride about the recent successes, we can't get any enjoyment due to the thunderstorm that is breaking loose in the south. Our recurrent question is whether the Hungarians will hold their positions in the north. Our days in Rossosh are carefree. The daily attacks by the Russian bombers can't disturb our peace of mind. We enjoyed a quiet and contemplative New Year's Eve with a bottle of champagne, reminiscing about the turmoil of the year 1942. What is going to happen in the coming new year? It is fortunate that we don't know. After all that we hear and see, I believe it will come to a decision in 1943. We have used up a lot of our energy in the East and the West, and it is only the Russians who are mobilizing their best resources. The 15th of January, 1943. The sky is clear this morning. The temperature is around 30 degrees C. White layers of fog are covering the Kalitwa swamps. Our comrade Herbert has a weak bladder and leaves the room at five o'clock hours, slamming the door. He re-enters the room, white as chalk, screaming, Russian tanks. I am immediately wide awake and go out onto the street. I can clearly hear the rumbling of tanks, and shortly afterwards an explosion. Damned, these bastards must be very close. Now they appear on the other side, pushing one after the other through the gardens. They stop, fire and lumber toward the centre of the city. 10, 15, 18, 20 heavy blocks of steel, T-34 and KWI, reach the bridge. The infantry dismounts and fans out. Six heavy tanks drive by in close distance without noticing us, continuing on to the railroad station. These bastards want to cut our troops off. It is time for us to get ready. We don't have heavy weapons or explosives. We have almost no troops left in the city. We throw some of our belongings onto the carts and slowly move to the main street along the buildings for protection. Black clouds of fire hover above the city. Stukas are dive-bombing on the Russian tanks like hawks, thus distracting the red bastards from us. We broke through the ring after one hour. Burning Rossosh now lies behind us, the last tanks fire shells into our convoy. Escape. Every soldier on the Eastern Front is familiar with the harshness of the Russian winter. Chaos and terror is everywhere. Tanks have been abandoned, disabled or burning vehicles lie along the roads. There is constant bombing by the Russians. 
Food supplies are burning. There are long waits in snowbanks and we are frostbitten. The slightest injury can cause major problems, for medical service is non-existent. Nobody helps you anymore. Everyone is on his own. The weak ones die in the gutter or in the blizzard. Ten or twenty fear-stricken men are hanging on the sides of a truck and are being crushed to death in the convoy. Some have lost their gloves, their fingers are frozen stiff. They are weak and fall down, only to be killed by the trucks that follow along in the convoy. Begging, whimpering, cursing and shooting. Whoever has been subjugated to this wretched experience will never forget it for the rest of his life. The terrible has now happened. The Hungarians in the north are retreating, or you could say that the entire army is fleeing in panic. Nikolaevka. The night is illuminated by hundreds of fires. Bombs are falling constantly. The air is filled from the noise of the explosions, the rumbling from collapsing buildings, the fiery explosions of vehicles filled with gasoline and the screaming of injured people. Panic-stricken horses are galloping across the burning streets, trampling everything in their path. Where should we go? Should we follow the stream of refugees to Walniki, or should we turn to Budjanij, which is closer to the front? I am using all my influence to convince my comrades to go to Budjanij as the next destination. Russian tanks have broken through everywhere. After Budjanij, I am totally familiar with the terrain, which is of utmost importance for all unforeseen events. On the next morning I receive a message that close to Walniki Russian tanks have attacked and destroyed our entire convoy, God help us. Budjanij has been abandoned, Walniki has been abandoned, retreat to Wolokonovo. Wolonokovo too has been conquered after a bitter fight with Russian tanks. Escape, retreat, desperation. We reached Bielgorod in almost total exhaustion. If somebody had told me a quarter of a year ago that I would see Bielgorod again, I would have declared him insane. In case somebody had predicted in my presence that the front line would be here again, I would have broken every bone in his body. And yet everything is now the same again as it was a year ago. The bloody sacrifices of the entire summer have been in vain. God give us the strength to endure and keep us from being weak. Arrival in Kursk The military command of the army ordered us to get the last heavy artillery and transport vehicles ready as quickly as possible. Two companies were established with the remaining troops and the soldiers on vacation who were waiting at the railroad station. Woronesh has been abandoned. Kastonoja has fallen. Sektikri is being threatened. The flood of the Reds is rolling toward the west like an avalanche, crushing everything in its path. Kursk will be overrun very soon. Occasionally I meet old comrades who have struggled through to our position. Their pale faces are contorted with terror and deep despair. They tell us about their horrible experiences. Heinz Schiele from Latuaha arrives and talks about the attack of Russian tanks on a hospital train. Partisans blew up a railroad bridge near Kastanoje. Two trains filled with helpless injured soldiers were stuck on the tracks. In that moment Russian tanks arrived and launched shells at the train cars. This was an easy target for them. After half an hour only smouldering remains are left on the railroad tracks. The last scream and the last whimpering have since died off. One of the thousand of catastrophes in these days has come to an end. The Reds have reached Poniri, the important railroad line to Oral. Stigri has to be abandoned. Kursk is now also in jeopardy. The military command orders the defence of the city, but the rank-and-file soldiers feel that this is useless, that it is too late. The motivation of the armies, divisions and the hundred thousand soldiers is at its lowest point. This is the consequence suffered by most soldiers who fought on the murderous front for forty-one days and nights without any break, while their comrades were having a good time in France. You can only endure this up to a point, and God help us in case an unforeseen emergency arrives. Damn, we are tired, our hearts are broken. God knows we are totally committed soldiers on the front line. We trust our leaders and accept heavy burdens without complaint and with an open heart. But let the spoiled soldiers in the West act as soldiers. Don't talk to me about the English invasion. Let the Tommies come. They will never return when we fighters on the Eastern Front pull off their roast beef legs. The enemy is now at Kursk's gate. Food supply, equipment and spare parts depots have been cleared out and the last medical corps has evacuated the city. Bombs are raining down on the buildings day and night. 
The railroad station is burned out and totally destroyed. No train is under steam anymore for its many expectant happy vacationers. Railroad station Kursk. This was the dream of a hundred thousand German soldiers. This is where the bliss of four weeks of indescribable vacation began. It is here where I climbed onto the train with a pounding heart yearning for my home, Germany. The terrain is now covered with deep bomb craters. The barracks where we received our food supply is burned out. The sign advertising vacation trains to Germany has been torn to shreds by the bombs. Isn't this like a symbol? Or maybe an admonishment to wipe away all sweet thoughts about vacation, homeland, wife and children, to open the heart for the horrible fight for our very existence? There will be no victors or losers in this fight, only survivors and permanently marred human beings. The situation is now serious. Once more I receive orders to secure any remaining sensitive documents and records. The rest of the important communication equipment is transported in a second truck. During the night, we arrive in Sudsa via Ligov. The next morning, we continue marching in the direction of Sumi. The streets are covered everywhere with snow and crowded by the retreating Hungarians. There is an endless convoy of sleds and tanks. What a miserable bunch. They lumber through the snow, apathetic and somber, their feet covered with rags, heavy hiking poles in their fists, and some are carrying only their rifle case. They discarded or sold their rifle a long time ago. Yes, they sold their own rifle. The sleds are loaded with loot or goods for which they have traded. These are no longer soldiers but riffraff. Their own downfall was caused by themselves. By the afternoon it is only 14 kilometres to Sumi. We are hungry and freezing. The icy storm rattles our bones. 14 kilometres more and we will enjoy a warm shelter. The village Shoichenko is on the right. A forest is on the left and ahead of us. The deep red sun sets over the treetops. It is a peaceful picture that reminds us of our homeland, since forests are rare in this area, yet we are so accustomed to them. Nobody can hold it against me for being nostalgic about my home. I am cherishing my beautiful memories. Suddenly we are faced again with the harsh reality. A single loud bang knocks us over. Constant flashes of light appear at the edge of forest, and now also at the villages located further above. Three shots hit our windshields. Several pieces of shrapnel fall to the left and right. Let's get out of the car immediately. We are wedged in by the Hungarians' last vehicles. Ahead of us are a German car and a truck. Everywhere, Hungarians run in all directions, panicked. None of them shoots. They don't have any weapons left anyway. All we hear is screaming, whimpering, the singing and chirping of machine gun fire, the dull thump of the mortars, and the howling of the anti-tank guns. Our two trucks swerve on the snow-covered road. The Hungarian sleds are blocking the road. We beat on the guideless horses, and with superhuman strength succeed in tilting the sleds off the road. We now remain the only target and are now attracting fire from carbines and guns. We are in a stupor. We have to get the trucks ready. We succeeded. The first truck starts moving. The cover of the truck is hit by machine gun fire. The carbine was shredded into two pieces in the hands of my comrade, Deutschler. But our track is rolling. Firebombs hit the snow in front of us. Two centimetres anti-tank projectiles drop on the side of the road. Damned bastards. I stand on the running board of my truck and look around. Black smoke billows from the truck cover. The gas is burning. We are close to our destination and it is over. The second truck is lost as well. A burning Ford blocks the road. Now we have to run for our lives. We run through snow that is up to our knees. We are surrounded by rifle fire. Totally exhausted, we arrive in the evening in Junakauka. It is incredible. None of us six comrades have sustained any injuries. God help us in our future. The village had been cleared and levelled. In the forest are traces of approximately 200 partisans or remaining Red Army troops. It is not our task to verify this. The area of the attack is horrific, even after the snow has blown over the mangled corpses. Smashed sleds, trucks, cars, dead horses, and about 80 fallen Hungarians lie on the ground. A German car was riddled with bullets like a sieve. It is covered with soft snow, as if to pity the distorted bodies of our comrades. 
At a short distance in the middle of the ruins is the German truck which provided a path for us through the snow. The sergeant and the soldiers are dead, killed by shrapnel. And now I recognise my truck. I am tremendously relieved. A quick check reveals that the truck has been pillaged, but the documents are still there. Some of the boxes have been opened. The motor is still OK, but the loading structure and the cover have been heavily damaged. The second truck has burned down to the tyres. Blackened iron rods lay in the snow. A sad picture. But we are happy since we still have the second truck, including its valuable load. In the evening we arrive in Sumi and are temporarily on safe ground. Sumi is now being threatened from the south. Far on the west side the enemy has broken through and is now near Romney, half the distance between Kursk and Kiev. The air is totally calm on this icy cold February morning. The sun rose on a cloudless sky. Its yellow-red sphere provides a stark contrast to the pale grey sky. Above the horizon are stripes of green interspersed with shades of pink. The icy air generates a crackling sound. Day and night are reflected in the hollows of the snow, which when uncovered by the sunlight, shimmer with a blue light, mysterious as the light in a grotto. Where the sun beams hit the snow, the colours change to the paleness of a corpse, touched by a vibrant reddish breath. With our tired legs we shuffle through the snow. Ragged horses pull the six sleds. Attached to the first sled is an akia, a toboggan which is weaving left and right in its attempt to follow the tracks. It is a silent convoy, a death knell. The Akya carries a precious load, the body of our leader, First Lieutenant Simon. His corpse has been with us for 18 days and nights as a token of our comradeship. During this, shots from the enemy were being fired above his body, intending to destroy us. We finally broke through the Red Ring. Our First Lieutenant is with us, and this is good. We can't stop now. Charkow has been abandoned due to pressure from the enemy. The large depots and buildings have been blown up, the beautiful mansions dating back to the times of the Tsar have been burned down. Stalingrad Rostau Charkow. The big triangle is now in the hands of the Reds and lost for us. We desperately cling to every village and city, but the enemy is too strong. We have to retreat after a few hours of bitter fighting. Our faces are grey. Bitter desperation settles in our hearts as our toughest enemy. It is 40 degrees C. The snow level is as high as our bodies. The steaming, agitated and exhausted horses can't even pull the empty sleds anymore. Our small group becomes smaller and smaller. Only half of them are still able to fight. Injured soldiers, many with frostbite, load their carbines and shoot. They lumber through the snow. Their faces are contorted with pain. In the midst of the blizzard, some fall behind and lose their group, which was supposed to support them. The tanks of the Reds arrive everywhere. All of a sudden, silhouettes can be seen on both sides of the road. Our Stukas always arrive on time to get us out of this mess. We continue to rush through the snow. Everything is so totally useless. The icy cold numbs us so much that we are losing the will to survive. Who cares about the shrapnel of the tank shells and ricocheting bullets from the enemy carbines? We are tired, incredibly tired. After the relatively mild weather of yesterday and the day before, temperatures ranged between minus 15 degrees and minus 29 degrees degrees C, a sudden change in the weather. A whistling, piercing wind sweeps through, pushing ahead the dry snow in wide sheets. A dirty grey sky, in which the sun is glued on it like a lemon yellow, starts to fade. We have met up with other retreating troops that have suffered equal losses and are now forcing our way together as a considerable fighting power toward the northeast. During the day, we take turns fighting or sleeping in snowdrifts. At night, we sneak past villages that are occupied by the enemy. Provisions and ammunition are scarce, but the mood is better, because here and there we keep hearing about new divisions that are supposed to be attacking from the south. A thin sickle of a moon is hanging in the ink-dark night. With the fall of darkness, we have moved away from the enemy. At first, the road is blocked by a snowdrift. Then there is hissing rifle fire and loud thuds in the snow from exploding shells. Assault troops are filing along the waves of the snowy desert. Corpses are lying around everywhere. There were many fatalities. And we continue to march, a forever lasting and painful rush through the deep snow. 
We are now sitting in a dank basement around a fuel drum, which substitutes for an oven, and are enjoying the comfortable heat. This morning we broke through the last line of the Soviets. The dark blood from our dead horses still sticks to our uniform, from when we had to lie along the highway behind their still warm corpses. These short and shaggy horses from the steppe saved the lives of some of our comrades. But let's not spend any more thoughts on this anymore. As a matter of fact, we don't even want to reflect about the past. We just want to sit around silently and hold our icy cold hands to the fire and feel the warmth streaming through our bodies, slowly, very slowly. And as we look at each other, we are trying to smile. Where is the winter? At the front door. Where is the horror? We have probably passed the last barrier. Outside, death is still haunting the streets. Heavy Soviet artillery is shelling the northern part of the city, but we are just sitting around a glowing fuel drum and trying to smile. We are quite safe and are now getting homesick. We yearn to join our brave and courageous army division. We heard that they fought gallantly. But right now we have only one question. How can we get to Oral? With a few tricks and some cigarettes, we secure several flat rail cars, Rungenwagen, to head up north on this beautiful evening. Beautiful is certainly not an apt word in this context, considering the icy blizzard whipping across the railroad tracks. The trip turns into an endless misery, and the rumour spreads once again that these are the foot soldiers' final weeks in the East. The hissing curse, Scheisser shit, is an expletive used by generals and privates alike, and is now used also by the Russian civilian population. This crude expression is symptomatic for the entire state of the war. It characterises the disappointment and rage, reluctance and impatience. But a bit of humour alleviates everything, even if it is just morbid humour. But not to despair, in case we don't get a meal, if our vehicles get stuck in the mud or snow, if our machine gun is covered with layers of ice when we change positions, when we miss the mail from our home country, we use only one word, scheisse. We stop in Gomel for two hours. This is the area where the glorious 8th Italian Army has settled down. It is not a friendly reunion. A rumour is going around that some of these guys haven't been allowed to take any vacation for two years, and that several regiments have been decimated. I don't know whether this is correct, but this certainly should teach them a lesson. We are now in Oral. We left the vast partisan-infested forests and the air attacks behind us. On the same day, we rejoin our comrades who were deployed in Oral. We are now at home, ready to face our next adventures. This is the time when an invisible force sucks all colour and light from the surrounding landscape and immerses it with a grey layer, which is the desolate national colour of this country. Very often this country is depressing, but never as poignant as in this hour. It is now five o'clock, yet it is dark in our bunker. The narrow slit offers only a pale grey view to the outside. Our little stove is glowing. The fire cracks and spits. In these grey hours we can enjoy the warmth of the fire. This is not possible during the daytime, since it would betray our position to the enemy. It is beyond comprehension that despite the proximity of the front, we are still able to enjoy a quiet moment, a moment where we can dream and reflect. Surrounding our little stove is not only a cloud of warmth, but also our silent emotions. We sit around and smoke, interrupting the silence with only a few sentences. The sun sets, blurring the outlines of the landscape mellowing our hardship at the front. And now it is time for toasted bread. Our stove has reached the right temperature, and now the pleasant ceremony of the soldier starts. We cut large slices of the dark bread and place it on a plate in the stove. The slices turn brown and crispy. The unforgettable smell of the bread fills the cramped space of the bunker. It is a smell which reminds us of long lost days, of the coziness and the pleasantness of the world. There are many ways to toast the bread, which permits you to distinguish the characteristics of the people in the bunker, the greedy person, the easy person, the unconcerned person, and apathetic person. The experienced toaster is patient, but will start dreaming when he stands at the stove and becomes distracted from the bitter reality, if only for a short time. A pitch-black night has now fallen outside. The first shots are fired, shells howl in the icy snowstorm. 
The fleeting pictures of our homeland pass quickly. The fine blue smoke from our toasted bread has vanished. The trenches demand once again the full attention of every soldier. In come the impacts from shells. More and more impacts. Thousands, tens of thousands. Countless shells without any break. One cannot distinguish any more between each explosion. It is now a continuous noise of bursting and cracking, a never-ending infernal noise. The time does not pass. Every minute feels like an hour. We crawl into our bunkers and snow dugouts. In the beginning we are still talkative, but then we become more and more silent. We are hoping that the explosions will stop and the enemy will attack. Right now we have to endure this endless drumbeat. Outside the landscape slowly changes its snowy appearance. Shrapnel destroys the camouflage and shakes the snow from the branches. The howling storm whirls the snow in all directions. But the noise of the explosions is drowning out the howling of the wind. The explosions singe the earth and eat up the snow which has turned into a green and black mass covering the ground. Hot pieces of metal, tiny splinters and jagged pieces as big as your palm, howl through the air. This has been going on for three days and nights, interrupted only by short breaks. The fire stops only when the Bolsheviks attack. But since we beat them back every time, despite their tanks and superior numbers, their horrible shell fire starts again every time and engulfs our positions with a widespread and incomparable vengeance. And then, slowly, the whiteness of the snow turns black. The Reds deploy their people and weaponry brutally and recklessly. Here and there they succeed in breaking through our front. Their losses are just as heavy as ours. A few comrades are lying quietly at the bottom of the trench. Snowflakes have settled on their stony faces. It is Sunday. An eerie quietness covers the desolate landscape after the embittered fights during the last three days. The naked winter soil is exposed by the torched Bolshevik tanks. And there are many such dark blotches in the terrain, motionless and silent. We get used to the fact that enemy attacks continue to be followed by more attacks, even after we mowed them down more than ten times. We get used to the earthen-coloured masses of enemy troops which seem to grow out of the soil and advance like a steamroller, yesterday, today, and certainly tomorrow. Many times we ask ourselves during the few quite hours between the attacks, did the dead awaken again? All thoughts stay focused on the present moment when barrages surround us day after day, when volleys of explosive charges are hurled at us, grenades howl without interruption, when bombs explode and tanks shriek. All our actions and thoughts are concentrated on survival, and we learned to hate. We have seen our comrades lying on the ground, barely recognisable. Even so, he was dear and precious to us. Late in life we learned to hate, this wasn't in our nature, and to think that everything used to be so smooth before. But it is not too late. We receive our mail. The content is more serious than it has been during the past weeks. It reveals to us the mood in our homeland and their worries about us. Our fights are tough and relentless as never before. We know that they are aware of this back home. It is now a fight for survival, a fight for everything. About twenty white beams are scanning the sky. This is the night of the bombers. Yesterday Russian planes dropped propaganda leaflets. They announced terror attacks and advised the civilian population to leave the city. Bombs of all sizes fall through the night. Countless fireworks and magnesium cluster bombs, also known as Christbaum, Christmas trees, illuminate the night sky with a dark red glow. The exploding anti-tank shells fall down like sinking stars, and the yellow flashing of shrapnel bombs, a true Hexen Sabbath, which is Sabbath. This night brings heavy losses for our men and our weapons. On account of these hellish nights, our meals for the next weeks consist only of margarine and minimal rations. It has now become quieter on the front. On one early morning we are told to move from our present position to support our comrades further back. We are six kilometres behind the main front line, which is very close to the rear limit. After ten hours of refreshing sleep, which was interrupted only twice by Ivan's bombs, we are in a good mood and enjoy our breakfast. It is a picture of almost tranquil peace under such circumstances, and we are very astonished when our babushka gets busy moving all her pitiful belongings to safety. She takes the few pictures and the completely blind mirror from the wall, 
and removes the icon out of the corner. I ask her what the purpose of this is, but she hesitates to give me an answer. My comrades pack their belongings in the meantime. Our experience with previous retreats has taught us that when the civilians start to pack their belongings, it is time for us to get ready as well. In January, we were in Budjeni and Valniki. In February, Volchowsk and Bielgorod. It is always the same. We establish our billets in the village huts or in the stone buildings which at least have windows. The local people greet us with joy and civility, reading every wish from our lips. We lay down to recover from our previous sleep deprivation. When we wake up, we call Matka, one of the women in the hut, as the fire went out during the night and we are freezing horribly. But nobody shows up. We look around. The entire family has vanished. We wait hours for an explanation, hours of almost unnatural Sunday quietness. Suddenly fire and explosions surround us again. We are already familiar with this grinding sound, interrupted only by short moments of silence, and then the heavy shower of the barrage impacts. The infernal concert started at sunset and lasted without break almost until midnight. And then, suddenly and abruptly, it stops just like it had begun. Then we hear the alarm. The Soviets have broken into the city. The nightly fight for the buildings has started. The civilian population had already escaped from Bielgorod a week before its capture by the Soviets. But we scoffed at such an ambush by the Reds, for we had considered it impossible. The front was far, very far. Then one morning there were no more civilians in our billet. But the Russian tanks were in front of the buildings. We learned our lesson. With mixed feelings, we remember now the hasty preparations of our babushka. Our good mood is gone. All the civilians in the other quarters have also vanished without a trace. The famous rats have left the sinking ship. We should dismantle our telescopes. We are going to be facing a lot of problems. We have known these guys long enough. The civilians usually stay in their huts like cockroaches. They don't flee when they are threatened by bombs or grenades. But the civilians have now escaped, since they were expecting the red attacks to go building by building. Their communication system is creepier than all the tribal drums in Africa. By nightfall, almost every civilian has disappeared, silently like a bad stench. There is an unusually loud rumbling and cracking around 19 o'clock hours toward the front. A little bit later, a messenger from our regiment arrives and alerts us that the Reds have broken through the front line and are now at a distance of 10 o'clock metres from the village. The fight for the village endures two days and nights. We have a tough time of it until we succeed in pushing the Soviets back. On the third day, the HKL, Hauptkampflinie, main front line, has been re-established. And at the same time, the civilians return, friendly and innocently smiling like children, as if nothing had happened. The bullet-riddled windows have been repaired, the damaged walls have been covered, and the shredded roofs have been resealed. Babushka, Matka and the children work from dawn to dusk. In the evening, the large family sits around the stove or lies on the floor. At the edge of the village is our ammunition depot. While this is not the best, it isn't a problem since Ivan has not paid us a visit for a long time and it is very well camouflaged. The snow is already very soft, but the wind is still icy. At night we sink into our straw beds, totally exhausted. Again, like the other nights, we yearn for our Russian hosts to retire so that we can get a good night's sleep on our straw mats. But nobody moves. We try to hide our heads in the pillows. During the afternoon, our hosts stayed in the sticky but warm huts. Later on, they disappeared with their wives and kids into the potato storage. When we found them, they were grinning sheepishly but did not talk to us. We finally get our rest and swear that we will shoot anybody who disturbs our sleep. Suddenly we wake up. Fragments from the window are lying on my body. Glass shards and debris is everywhere. And near the stove, a palm-sized splinter is sticking out of the clay wall. And now it is rumbling and cracking everywhere. Ivan's airplanes fly until two in the morning. I count 53 bomb explosions. One third of the village is destroyed by the time they left. But at least they did not succeed in hitting our ammunition depot, which would have flattened the entire village. In the morning, the entire clan appears again and repairs their houses yet again as good as possible. 
For three more nights they continue to sleep on the oven, only to disappear later again in the potato storage. Meanwhile we catch on to what they are doing. We pack our belongings and also seek cover in the sticky potato holes. Tonight the Russian bombers return once again and destroy half the remaining village. The rest is smashed to smithereens from the exploding ammunition depot. Once again the Russian civilians were better informed. They have their own underground communication network with the Russian front. Our GFP, Secret Field Police, tried very hard to crack their communication system, but it was futile. I have been standing on the road to the front for hours, waiting to guide the trucks into their positions. Platoons are pushing forward, the artillery rumbles by, the ground vibrating from the grinding wheels. To my rear I can see the flickering glow of cigarettes. My spade bangs against my gas mask at every step. A horseback rider gallops forward. Somebody asks what time it is, it's two in the morning. A canteen nearby is brewing fresh tea. The smell of tea with rum wafts over the road. Cooking utensils are rattling. Ahead of us is a thundering noise. Sheet lightning illuminates the sky, the muzzle flash of the heavy artillery. In between is the tack-tack-tack hammering of machine guns, just like the second hand of a pocket watch. Finally, at three in the morning, our platoon trucks arrive, which had been delayed due to attacks by Ivan. After a peaceful cigarette, we advance. The road gets worse and worse, strewn with potholes. In Matuoje, we come upon the firing zone. The impacts are now close to our road. Vehicles are rushing back. Somebody shouts from the last vehicle, The ammunition truck has been hit! At the edge of the village is a bright darting flame, which illuminates the trajectory of the enemy artillery. Now it is getting serious. Somebody shouts, Stop! More fire! Take cover! The ground trembles from the multiple dull thuds. We cling to the ground as if it could provide us with protection. Splinters are buzzing and whirring by, only to be interrupted by the dull thuds in the distance, the shots from the next round. But we have to advance. Our platoon has to be in position by morning. We reach the Corduroy Road, the worst stretch of all. There are countless bomb craters on both sides, and we are attacked again and again on the ground. Russian fighter planes are strafing us. What remains of the village of Blashkatoo consists of no more than smouldering beams, broken household goods, and lonely chimneys in the centre of destroyed houses, blazing huts, and the disgusting smell of burning flesh. We are close to our target. At 5.20 hours our platoon is in position, but two good comrades are missing. The muddy season. Bright sunshine follows snow and hailstorms which have swept across the steppe. The thaw starts to settle in after three sunny days. On the fourth day it is so warm that the water mixes with the soil and dissolves everything into layers of mud and dirt. Last weekend the meltwater reached up to our knees and filled up the creeks and gardens. The surrounding landscape is a giant lake. Our vehicles are stuck. It takes us three to four days to move a single vehicle, which before took only an hour. We are lucky that our boots arrived on time, which has at least provided us with minimum protection against the icy water. Everybody is preparing to live like an amphibian. Proven medicines against common illnesses are dispensed, just like the previous year. The weather is horrible. In addition, we are under severe attacks day and night. Something wonderful happens during these days. A battalion of young soldiers with fresh faces and new equipment arrives. Their boots are shining and their pots and pans have never been used on a Russian stove, though we notice this much later. The wonderful thing is that they were marching in rows of three and were singing. We step out of the heavily shelled huts and bunkers which have been our home and are unable to comprehend such a miracle. We stand there silently in our camouflage, caked with dirt and we touch our stubbly faces in disbelief. They march along a series of small grave mounds with crosses on top, and I get the impression that their voices tremble for a moment. We lower our heads in silence and look down on our wet, clay-encrusted boots. Somebody cracks a joke, a cruel joke under these circumstances. They will stop singing pretty soon. But nobody laughs, nobody agrees with the joker. We all know that these young comrades from the homeland will march the final two or three kilometres to their positions in rows or single file. Each will hold his rifle in his hands to avoid banging it against their cooking utensils.
For a moment they will be astonished when they get instructions to empty their pants and coat pockets and place everything in their breast pockets, and they will shiver to the bone when they understand the purpose of this order. The same happened to us when we jumped into the trenches. The icy water reached up to our waist and flooded our boots, our pants clung to our thighs. But they will endure it just like we did. They will enjoy the blessing of the bunker stove. Its heat expels the water in our pants and socks into milky rivulets. And when their uniform has the proper clay crust, nobody will be able to distinguish them from us anymore. They think a lot about us, and we almost feel tenderness toward our young comrades. We envy their singing which refreshes our old memories. This winter has been very harsh to us. It could have frozen our hearts banned the laughter from us and caused us to forget our songs. The bitter cold, the howling snowstorms, the days without food, and the nights without sleep have imprinted deep wrinkles on our stubbly faces. Occasionally we receive these overly clever letters from home asking us about the mood on the front. We shake our heads in disbelief over such stupid questions. Silly civilians, we are soldiers fighting on the front. A storm is brewing over the steppe to the east, the second storm from Mongolia. We have to lean our bodies against the storm. Step by step we dig into the ground and thus succeed in holding our position. Don't ask us how we are able to survive this winter. Never ask us at home to talk about this. When one grinds his teeth during the long winter months, he has difficulties opening his mouth later on. Don't ask us in the future. We stand our ground silently and fight, and we will continue to fight. We never want to think about it, we want to forget everything. And now our comrades are passing us with a song on their lips. We hold the belief that our heart is armoured with ice and steel. And now that we feel it beating again, we are aware how the long winter has been ravishing us. Our young comrades should continue singing. We should stand side by side. We, out of the purgatory of the long winter, and our comrades with their young hearts and innocent confidence. Overnight, a fresh wind started blowing off the clouds which had been covering the sun. Within a week, the water and mud, against which we had been fighting a losing battle, has disappeared. But nobody is quite yet ready to believe in the miracle of springtime. The first dust clouds which are blown along the dry roads still generate suspicious looks. Maybe nature is playing a cruel joke with us. But we are happy that spring has arrived in such a pleasant way. It is now quiet in our sector. Occasional assaults by enemy artillery, a few attacks by red aircraft. Our bunkers are secure and are withstanding the bombs. They have been fortified with planks and railroad ties. Until a short while ago we didn't trust such peace on the front, just like the unusually mild weather. But now it looks like Ivan has finally surrendered. From time to time we are even able to relax for one or two hours. We reminisce often about the tough weeks of the winter battle at Oral. The main focus of the battle during the second half of February has been on the west side of Oral, to be followed a few days later on with an unprecedented ferocity on the southeast side of the city. The enemy concentrated strong battalions, tanks and heavy artillery at both locations. It was therefore not surprising when the thunder of the artillery started on an icy February morning. What has occurred so far at this undefeated section has been pure hell. Even experienced fighters in the trenches have never encountered such a ferocious attack. The Russians launched a massive attack with infantry consisting of 120,000 to 200,000 troops, 400 tanks and 120 to 150 batteries, which was an extraordinary number on the Eastern Front. It is almost unbelievable that the German divisions could withstand such an overwhelming onslaught, but it is the enemy who was fully aware of this. Last but not least, the high loss of troops and material, caused by futile attempts to break through in the same sector, has taught the Bolsheviks a lesson that the defenders will hold their ground despite their own vastly superior forces. The Bolsheviks' goal to cut off Oral in a pincer operation from the north to the south at the same location has motivated them to deploy these gigantic resources. We realised from the first hours of the massacre that it was essential to defend the prominent bastion of Oral, the most eastern point of the entire front. We were also aware of the fact that we could meet the same fate as our brave comrades in Stalingrad. Besides the north-south pincer with attack points at Bolchow and Poniri, 
the Soviets have deployed two more spearheads west of Shizdra, in the direction of Bryjosk and at Ligov. Furthermore, the forest area of Karatshu at Gomel is a giant area of marshes 500 kilometers wide, which is completely impenetrable during the winter time. It is also occupied by thousands of partisans and regular airborne troops. Every other deployment of replenishments has been robbed by bandits. All that we can do is hold our position to the bitter end. There cannot be any deliberation about our methods. Our position was very clear. Our only chance at survival is to defend ourselves. It is a tough battle for men who have nothing to lose. It was this horrible realization that made everything so easy at the time. Many soldiers marched to their death with a smile on their pale faces. The barrage of shells and heavy artillery has commenced, covering the German positions and fortifications. Bombers drop their loads in rows along the trenches, and in addition, armoured fighter airplanes nosedive over the battleground and target us with their machine guns. And then the first wave of the Bolshevik infantry and tanks starts rolling in. It is both horrifying and unique, but we are not supposed to talk about this. We defend ourselves with a courage reinforced with desperation and handle our weapons like skilled craftsmen. It looks like everything is to no avail. Too fierce are the recurring attacks on our positions and everything that moves or sticks out of the icy cold winter landscape. Too vicious are the ever-present fighters which fly in groups like white lumbering birds of death with their rattling machine guns close above the main HKL. There are too many tanks and much too much infantry. Seven infantry divisions and four tank brigades just in the first days of the attack. The enemy succeeds in breaking through, deploying infantry and later on new tank brigades. In the first five days, 121 tanks are destroyed, only to have 80 new ones deployed the very next day. The poor weather conditions render the deployment of our Luftwaffe difficult. The losses are very high. Every day brings with it a new crisis, which we can only overcome with efforts that are beyond our human strength and our own blood. During these first days of March, we move to the southern sector, where a new focal point is forming. The enemy has deployed four armies and an air force command into the area between Kursk and Oral. Again and again, they attempt to break through the gaps in the decimated divisions of our right wing and to move around our entire southern wing. The battle has now reached its climax. Since the beginning of the offensive at the end of February, the enemy has suffered 35,000 troops dead, 280 destroyed tanks, and 140 downed aircraft. In spite of such huge losses, the fighting spirit of our enemy remains undiminished. Their push is directed to the west. We continue to fend off their forces to the southwest and north of Oral. In between, the enemy attacks our flanks with their motorized divisions and tanks. At the same time, they deploy strong forces on three more positions, to the southeast of Oral, at a location closest to the city, to the north of the Shistra section, and to our west. All attacks are supported by heavy artillery, not to mention the countless tanks. We destroy 77 out of 90 heavy tanks. The fights continue with an incredible ferociousness until March 10th, with heavy losses on both sides. The situation continues to teeter on the edge of a knife. Our ammunition and food supply are being exhausted. The most important supply lines are threatened or are under heavy attack by the enemy. We come to the bitter conclusion that this might be the end. Two days more and everything will be over. The miracle happens. The usual massive attack in the morning doesn't occur. There is still a lot of metal flying around, a mere pittance though compared with the previous days. Yet we stopped believing in miracles a long time ago and have the suspicion that some kind of deviltry is behind this absence of heavy attacks. Our senses are sharpened for the next assault, but there is no change, not during the night nor during the next day. We receive a message that our troops launched a counter-attack in Charkow, which is most likely the reason behind the mystery of the sudden diminishing number of combat operations. There are still a lot enemy units in the area which are now facing new realities. Their operational purpose is now in jeopardy and they are apprehensive. The battle at Oral is over. An early springtime with bright sunshine follows the second terrible eastern winter. With gratitude we look up from our trenches which are filled with the runoff from the melting snow to a bright and blue sky. The shining sun in the centre is like a symbol for the confidence in our victory. 
We are going to make it. Springtime has arrived faster than we expected. The last snow melted weeks ago. Due to the summer heat and drought, the mud which covered the entire landscape vanishes within days. On the front, we are again masters of our destiny. Platoon after platoon rolls over the roads covered with thick dust clouds from the panzers, Sturmgeschütze, mortars and long-barreled guns. This smells again like a major offensive. In a few weeks we are going to attack. We? I don't believe it. I guess we will be rounded up later on and then deployed to fight on the front. But let's wait and see. The first comrades have left already on leave, and it will be my turn in a few weeks. And now I am overpowered again by an eerie feeling that, so close to reaching my goal of a thousand happy dreams, something could happen to me. A persistent toothache, headaches or diarrhoea, suddenly everything assumes major significance. The recurring question is, I hope I am not going to get sick. I am in a bad mood these days. Our Luftwaffe and the enemy air force have been very active during these past few days. Day and night, dozens of bombers or fighter aircraft fly through the sky. And this is always a telltale sign. When the Totenvogel, birds of death, dart about, either we or the enemy are planning major events. It is like a movie theatre for the frontline soldiers. But this show is not without dangers. There is a lot of activity today. At the light of dawn, a squadron of Soviet bombers flies over our front line. Suddenly they make a sharp turn. They dive down and approach our position at high speed. Gauging from experience, they should now open their bomb bays and death should start to rain upon us. But nothing happens. Instead, we are now hearing the familiar howling sound of our fighters. We brace ourselves against the walls of the trench and watch the events unfold in the clear morning sky where they are fighting for life and death. The tight, evasive manoeuvring and shooting have started. Our fighter aircraft dive down on the slower bombers, whose gunners are attempting to shoot them down. The muzzle fires from the machine guns and the onboard cannons sparkle in the sky. Our fighters make their attack and then steeply pull up again with their engines howling to get on top of the enemy bombers. A Soviet bomber in the sky starts to tumble, dips his right wing, and then spins to the ground to explode in bright flames. Within the next three minutes, four more Soviet bombers meet the same fate. On this day, 74 Soviet aircraft were shot down in our sector. Yesterday, our first Tigers arrived and positioned themselves in a broad line behind our sector. This gives us a reassuring feeling, since the Reds are also assembling their tank units on the other side. The front is brimming with flaks of all calibres and sizes. We are quiet and confident since winter is over and the sun belongs only to us.